Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome to the third episode of Mitani TV. Last episodes were in Turkish and Kurdish, and today's episode will be in English. My name is Bauer Siyai. Sometimes I am a Kurd, sometimes I am a Turk, and other times an Ashri Syrian, Jewish. Sometimes I am a crying kid. Other times I am an Armenian whose granddad was slaughtered or even worse. Sometimes I am an SD kid's teardrop. I am a flower in the indigenous lands. I am a gypsy who is strung on a gallow, but before all, I am a human being. And for all of those who identify themselves as humans, research, read and question and fight together for a better tomorrow. Let us all form a new and better world. Now, it is time for commercials. We'll be right back. I've worked in construction for 40 years. I am and always will be Leona. Construction is one of the most stable industries in today's economy. There's plenty of opportunity, so come and learn at the Layuna Local 183 Training Center. It's the right place to start. If you're thinking about your future, you can learn a skilled trade through hands-on training and classroom training. Layuna Local 183 Training Center is excellence in training. All apprenticeship programs are registered with the Ontario Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities. Become an apprentice and learn new skills which will open the doors to a rewarding career. Visit 183training.com. Čau všichni, vítám vás zpátky na mém kanále a dneska jsem tu s tou asi nejlepší zpěvačkou, co osobně znám, s Diankou. Ahoj všem. A ty jo, myslíš, že si tě budou diváci pamatovat? Uvidíme. Pokud se vám zdá, že vám Dianka nějak povědomá, tak to je nejspíš kvůli tomuhle. Každopádně dneska jsme se tu s Dianko sešli, protože jsme si řekli, že by mohla být se nadat zkusit si zaspívat různý známý popový písničky ze světa v rámci jedné písničky. Udělali jsme si teda se znovu písniček, který bude zpívat Dianka a který budu zpívat já a uvidíme, snad to bude sranda. Jsi ready? Ready. Já jsem se narodil ready. Tak jo, jdem na to. Dream. We were sipping whiskey neat Highest floor, Bowery Nowhere's high enough You say you love me, I say you're crazy We're nothing more than friends You're not my lover, more like a brother I know you since we were like ten I need one dance Got in a sea in my hand One more time before I go I partake in a hole Best place to find the lovers so the bar is where I go Me and my friends at a table drink shots drinking fast and then we talk slow We come over and start up a conversation with just me and trust me I'll give it a chance Now I'll take my hand, stop a van, man on a jukebox and then we start a dance Now I'm singing you like say Turn the radio on, it's Friday night I won't be long, gotta do my hair Put my makeup on, it's Friday night I won't be long Please have mercy on me Take it easy on my heart Even though you don't mean to hurt me You keep tearing me apart yeah, You're looking at the truth, money never lie No, I'm the one, yeah I'm the one, early morning in a dawn Now you wanna ride now I'm the one, yeah I'm the one
This is our life. And we are Leona. Construction is one of the most stable industries in today's economy. There's plenty of opportunity, so come and learn at the Lyuna Local 183 Training Center. It's the right place to start. If you're thinking about your future, you can learn a skilled trade through hands-on training and classroom training. Lyuna Local 183 Training Center is excellence in training. All apprenticeship programs are registered with the Ontario Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities. Become an apprentice and learn new skills which will open the doors to a rewarding career. Visit 183training.com. Let's thank Liuna and Joseph Mantinelli, Executive Board, and also thank Liuna Local 183 and Jack Oliver, Executive Board. Another special thanks to every member of the Liuna organization and family. I hope all the viewers and people watching today have a wonderful time. I have brought with me a special guest today, Anna Bajiri, someone who has also went through the hardship of being born in a third world country. If you'd like to learn more about refugees and people immigrating to Canada for a better life, please continue to follow and watch us on air. Today, Anna Bajiri has welcomed us to her home and we would like to thank her for all of her hospitality, time out of her day, and to do an interview with us on Mitani TV. Let's watch. Günaydın sayın seyirciler. Bugün çok önemli bir konuğumuz var. Burada bir anlamda refüji çocukların annesi sayılan, onlarla ilgilenen, 20 yıldır çok değişik çalışmalar yapan, Kanada'da ilk konferansı yapan ve bu anlamda ikinci, üçüncüsünü yapan, e, geçim problemi olan, yaşam derdi olan, çocuklarına iyi bakamayan, buraya mülteci eden insanların dertleriyle, sorunlarıyla ilgilendiği gibi Kosti'de çalışıp, Orada da bizzat kendisi e, çocuklarla ilgilenmekte. Onların psikolojisiyle, kısacası hastalıklarıyla ve ya var olan bütün yaşamıyla ilgilenmektedir. Bugünkü konumuz Doktor e, Anna Benjamin. Is the right name? Benerji. <gülüyor> Anna Benerji. E, onunla kırık incem, İngilizcemle bir röportaj yapmaya çalışacağız. Ama a, tabii ki e, işin ağırlığı, işin yükünü ona bırakacağım. Çünkü dediğim gibi e, henüz e, hiçbir şeyimiz oturmuş değil. Ama var olan olaklarımızla en iyisini yapmaya çalışacağız. Welcome me to Dr. Anna Benerji. Thank you. How are you? Everything is well. good? Yeah, everything's fine. Thank you. Thank you. You open your house My for uh, Mitani TV. <laughs> now, first, uh, I know it's Toronto, Ottawa, and Canada and where many people know Dr. Anna Benerji. Your name is, uh, if come, any people had or any people think about doctor, he know, mother is children. <laughs> That's why uh, you can come a little bit, ask about yourself, wh where you study, okay. first where you work, what you're doing. Okay, sure. So my name is Anna Banerjee. I, was, um, I went to medical school in Toronto, at the University of Toronto. Um, and then I did a, a rotating internship, so as a family doctor, emergency doctor for about a year. Then I went back in, to Ottawa and did pediatrics for three years. Um, and then after that I went to McGill and studied uh, infectious disease um, and some tropical medicine. And then I went to British Columbia, I set up a tropical disease clinic, worked, in, um, worked on pre-travel, so vaccines you need for travel. Um, and I was trying to get people interested in tropical medicine and global health, but at that time no one was really interested. So I decided to, to, to apply for a Master's of Public Health at Harvard University. And I applied actually after the deadline, but I got in. And I went to Boston to study at the, school, the Harvard School of Public Health for a year in international health. So I was planning on going back to Toronto, but then SARS had happened. And because I was an infectious disease specialist and I had a master's of public health, 
they asked me to come to Toronto, um, Toronto Public Health to help with SARS. So I thought it would be a good short trip, visit my parents, visit my family, friends. Um, so I came as a consultant and then afterwards they asked, they offered me a job. And so I um, ended up working as an associate medical officer of health at Toronto Public Health doing um, public health in infectious disease and outbreak control. I did that for a while. My daughter was little when we came back to Toronto, about three years old. And then with very little warning, I adopted my son from the Arctic. He's Inuit. Um, the old term was Eskimo, but we, we call them Inuit. And, um, and then, uh, so I was off for a little while. Then I went back to work and I miss seeing patients. So I started working in um, um, a lot more work in refugee health. Um, I set up a clinic where I would see uh, children that were uh, immigrant refugee children, internationally adopted children, did that um, over 10 years ago. Then I um, used to be a consultant at a community health center, Access Alliance, where I would see um, newly arrived children. Um, and then um, 2009, I created a, a conference, the first, first refugee health conference, a national refugee health conference in Canada. It was called the Canadian Refugee Health Conference. And then in 2012, that was 2009, we, we merged with the Americans and then we became the North American Refugee Health Conference and it's the largest refugee health conference in the world now. Um, and I was doing that basically in my spare time, um, just it wasn't part of my job. But then in 2013, the vice dean at the University of Toronto said he liked the conference I created. So I created, so we had the, um, the North American Refugee Health Conference and in 2013 the Vice Dean at the time said he was really pleased with the Refugee Health Conference and can I do Indigenous Health, uh, create an Indigenous Health Conference and I said yes, Indigenous is First Nations Inuit Métis in Canada and I said yes because my son is from the Arctic, I've been across the country, um, I've been to many Indigenous communities, um, I've I've, I've met many Indigenous peoples, I said yes. And so I also then created in 2014 the Canadian, um, the Indigenous Health Conference, which is now the largest Indigenous Health Conference in Canada. We have about 700 people come from, uh, from all over Canada. Um, so, and then about um, eight years ago, or almost 10 years ago, uh, one of the, um, managers, the directors at Costi, Costi Immigrant Services, approached me and asked me if I could set up a, a clinic at Costi to see newly arrived government-assisted refugee children. And I said yes, but it took about five years to get that organized. So this is around 2008, 2009. It took about five years to get that organized. And then in 2013, I set up the Costi Pediatric Clinic. So what I do there now is as all the government assisted refugees come to Toronto or the GTA area, I, um, I screen them, I take a history, do a physical assessment, um, I update their vaccines, I look at their vaccines, try to, if I can, put it into an Ontario schedule so that they have a, vac a yellow vaccine book so they yeah. can go to school. I see what vaccines are missing, give them their vaccines, then I do blood tests and look for parasites and then just see what the problems are. Now the children stay there at Costi from two weeks to sometimes several months but usually it's just about two to three weeks so I try to get everything done there. There are vaccines and that so when they leave they have laboratory reports, they have uh, a vaccine book so when they go and get a family doctor somewhere else outside of Toronto they have a starting place. That a doctor who is a specialist with refugee children has seen them, screened them, started their vaccines, taken care of the major issues, treated the parasites, and so they have a, a better start. Some of the kids are very complicated. They have a lot of health needs, so I send them to other specialists, developmental specialists. For example, if someone has autism yes. or <clears throat> someone has cerebral palsy or someone has... You know, I sometimes have people with cancer or need or children that need blood transfusion. So then urgently I get them hooked up with the people they need to see. Um, so I, I try to manage their care while I'm taking care of them. 
Now, uh, I, uh, I can ask you about, uh, you know, every refugee is not coming here, coming with background psychology and uh, many health problems. Because many people as come as background don't have another, another uh, uh, don't have any uh, enough healthy issue. Yeah. Can go to doctor if got some somewhere don't have doctor. Is actually is uh, this one bothers so much with ch children. Yeah. Is refugee people first come here like which healthy problem exactly have it. It depends on what part of the world they're coming from. So when the Syrians came, we hit, when um, we had 40,000 Syrians come to Canada, um, Kosti asked me to set up a clinic at a hotel. And this was during the Christmas holidays, so no one else was there. So I went with my two Arabic-speaking volunteers, and we saw in three days 120 kids. And then we saw, um, in 2016, I saw 700 Syrian kids. Um, so for the Syrians, the big health problem was their teeth. They all had, many of them had dental cavities. Or some of them, their teeth were gone. It just, it was very um, severe dental issues. Um, but then you see the African kids. Some of the African kids, they just don't have enough food to eat, so they're small. Many of them have a lot of parasites in their intestines, or they have, um, or they have exposure to um, tuberculosis. Some of them have malaria. Um, some of them have blood disorders, so there's a whole bunch of things. And some of the children I've seen, they're born in refugee camps and they've never seen a doctor in their life. So they have many, many health issues, so I'm familiar with a lot of that. So I try to make sure that I screen for all of that so that, you know, I'm, I'm used to seeing refugee children, and so I, I look for certain things. But so a doctor that doesn't see a lot of refugees may not realize Oh, in this part of the world, there's problems because they don't have iodine in their salt, mm -hmm. um, and there's thyroid problems. Or that this part of the world, there's lead problems. Or in this part of the world, there's you know all the kids have parasites. Or this part of the world, the children are traumatized because they've come from a refugee camp. Or there, you know, your cities that I've seen that have grown up, um, you know, under ISIS. And they've never had, never been to a doctor. They don't have any treatment. They have parasites, and they've been traumatized. So it depends on the group. But I'm by now I'm very familiar with the different groups and their different health issues. So I try to get things going right at the beginning, so that when they start coming, the, m many of their problems are taken care of, uh, or at least we start the treatment so that, you know, if someone has asthma, I put them on asthma medications. And so when they go move somewhere else, at least they have the medications with them. So that's the kind of work I do. Uh, now, as the, you said, Surya, is every kid coming with the world, half the world, as actually with Surya and part of Rojava and Kurdistan, have psychological problem too, because I, sometime I got a, uh, home, I see the uh, kids have many psychological problems. That, that's why is what you see, see the, the, the, the just would kids have psychological problem or what one mom, it was dad, because many Rojava people come here, is don't have them, dad, the, the ISIS is kill the dad. Yeah. And that's why it's uh, like you see the kit is different, very, very different. You can imagine it with uh, Canada, or you can imagine it with Turkey, or part of Sham, or part of Tehran, or part of Ankara, because you know Kurdistan is colony, colony too. That's why what you see, what you see the kids is like this. How's your feeling? Well. I remember when I saw the first families that came from ISIS and I would hear those stories and it was very upsetting. It was just, even as a doctor you hear these stories, even though I've heard many, many stories before, it was, it's very upsetting. Um, the children, it depends on the, their age. The younger they are, if they're like two or three years old, often they forget. Some of the older kids have psychological problems, they have problems trusting people, some of them are abuse themselves. 
Um, and so they're, you know, they have a lot of psychological problems and, and it might take a long time for them to recover. But for a lot of the kids, you know, kids are very resilient. They have the trauma, but then somehow, you know, they, they seem to be, many of them seem to get over it. But they, you know, what they want is that they want a home. They want a safe place to live. They want, so, sorry. They want a home. They want a safe place to live. They want to go to school. Many of these kids have not had any education uh, in their time under captivity or wherever they're from, from war, or if they have any kind of problems, they're not sent to school. So uh, they, want, they want stability, they want an education, they want to make friends, they want to be normal like other people. They don't want to worry about, oh, is, there, is a bomb coming? Or, or is someone going to shoot me? Is someone going to take away my mother? So they, they really, they just want stability. Now, uh, I, I got this... Uh, Do you want me to take the turtle outside? No, no, no, it's okay, the okay. noise is okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh. Uh. Uh, now is, uh, I have uh, another, uh, I go to some refugee house, like I see two, three people, uh, kid is like make it little bit noise or little bit happy or something, say if, uh, if you don't sit, if you don't do it, I have to go to with uh, uh, your uncle, at kids be quiet, because I says every time take it mom to do with something, something very bad. And some kids I know, the, the age with uh, 12, 13, and 10, 11 with ISIS, his ISIS make it very, very bad thing. I don't like uh, example as a here. Maybe you can ask what happened or what he see and his life. The other, the, the, the other is, is the big problem is here he can make it like normal friend. I see everybody, if you said uh, kids what you need, first tell me I need friend. Yes. That's why maybe the, the everything have to go to talk to what school or something for more friend, more, more education. What do you think about that one? Yeah. Um, so I've heard many stories about the, the families, the children in ISIS, and they're very disturbing. Um, some of the younger children have watched their, their mothers uh, being sexually abused, being raped in front of them, uh, if I can be honest. Uh, and they see, it, see, see these men uh, beating their mothers, and it's very traumatic for them to watch that. And then some of the girls, when they turn... 10, 11, 12, they're being uh, physically and sexually abused by these people. And so how do you normalize life when you're, you know, you're 11 years old and you've been raped by someone from ISIS? I mean, I, I think that I'm saying it plainly because that is true. Not to everyone, but to some of these children, they've been sexually abused. And so we need to be very sensitive and kind and supportive because we can't imagine the trauma that some of these kids have been through and I think that they need to pe see people who are specialized in this I mean I'm not a specialist in this area but they need counseling and support um, and to be reassured that you're in a safe place here you know we should not this is a place where that's illegal you know, we have child protection, we have people who are here to support you, we have people that, you know, that shouldn't happen here. That is that is not normal. Being a child, playing, having friends, going to school, that's normal. And we try to, try to get them to try to live a normal life, but some of them are very traumatized. And they, they need support. They need support. Yeah. And uh, you think is Canada government, uh, uh, can make it enough support because uh, the actually is like, like two years. Uh, Justin Trudeau uh, stacked with him, bring many many refugee people. But this is I understand you. Everything bring here this very very nice, and Canada very big country and have uh, and rich country. But I heard some uh, refugee 
Ezidi refuge as not enough money for survive because nobody no English nobody can work and just look to with government and uh, Toronto is rent now very very high yeah, just he gives some some people just take it money for rent or just take it uh, for rent the other one just coming little bit first re refugee uh, the coming people little bit help but after three months four months six months ago everybody not don't have uh, can can do it every time is help the people that's why you you what you think can the, for more help take it for a, more for education for go to school for uh, because if you hungry you can take it and anything that's right so um i think that's a big a concern for a lot of the refugees that end up coming here that the money that they're given is really not enough to survive on a lot of these children they're malnourished and i try to get them to have vitamins multivitamins and iron um, but the truth is they can't afford it and so i go around i uh, try to get um some pharmaceutical companies to donate uh, vitamins and sometimes i have vitamins and iron and i give it to the kids sometimes i don't have any um and and so when you're trying to pay the rent with a little bit of money that you get through the government it's it's it's hard to eat it's hard to eat healthy you can eat things that are cheaper or fast food but to eat healthy to have fruits and vegetables and whole grains and that it's very hard and um so i think that's a that's an added stress so you don't have any money left over to go to a movie to you know to get away from the things that are making you stressed or to uh, to get nice clothes if you're looking for a job so in the first year the government supports you and then during that time you're supposed to get education and learn english and then and the second year the hope is that you get a job some people are not ready or some people are traumatized or some people they they can't get a job yet um and so then they go on welfare um so but i think that when you look at refugees and you follow them over a period of time, even though it's very difficult in the beginning, you look at them five years down the road, ten years down the road, most of them are, are doing extremely well. And they're doing well, they're thriving, they, they have, um, you know, they, they're supporting themselves, they're having education for their kids, their kids are doing well, their kids are going to university, they're getting careers. And so once they come, you know, the first year or two is very. It can be very, very difficult. But but the vast majority of them do well because they know what it's like not to have health care, to live in a war zone, not to have education, not to have stability, not to have friends, not to have a place to live. So when you come from that kind of environment and you come here, a lot of the refugees work really, really hard to try to make a good life for themselves. Now, uh, as uh, you make it first conference, Canada, this is congratulations, thank you, and you make it second one too, uh, third. Uh, We've had conferences, I think six refugee health conferences so mm -hmm. far, six since refugees. since two thousand nine was the first one. The how the people people is fantastic is conference or it's a health conference. It's to educate healthcare providers mm -hmm. on. Um, the best way to work with refugees and so um you know they learn about ptsd they learn about mental illness they learn about parasites they learn about tuberculosis they learn about you know working with trans interpreters about education there's so it's it's to try to make health care providers better at working more sensitive uh, with working with refugee populations uh, but we always have refugees speak at the conference um, that's very important because, and if a reg refugee is interested in healthcare, wants to come, then refugees are welcome to come. Anyone who's interested in refugee health. Uh, every year we have refugees speak. This year we had a um, Yazidi woman who I saw her children because they were at Costi and they were my patients. Uh, she spoke about her experience with ISIS. Then I spoke. Then two years before that, I think your friend um, who was a journalist in Turkey. Yeah, he spoke 
Yes. Mr. Nozad Keskin, yeah. Yes. He, he, I saw his children as well. I met him and his wife and his children at Costi, and I um, took care of the children when they were there. And we kept in touch, and, and uh, he, um, so he spoke about his experience, you know, being, um, you know, uh, how he showed a picture of his house and his family, and the next picture was his house, and the, the whole place was bombed. And he told about a story of persecution. And so I think it's very important that, that for the healthcare providers to hear these stories. A lot, of, a lot of us doctors that work, and nurses and social workers that work with refugees, we've heard many stories, but some people are new. And so they need to know about the stories of refugees that come, the, the difficulties, but more the success. You know, that they come here, they their houses have been bombed, they, you know, maybe people, their family members have died, you know, and they come here and they're they're starting again and they they, they end up living very successful lives. So so in some ways the refugees become our heroes. Yeah, now uh, <clears throat> you know uh, Zose. Yes. Uh, thank you, you give me three computer I give the one is Zose. <laughs> The other one is another family. He have six kids, and uh, I have to take it one is London. Okay. I have to go to with uh, Zose too. Okay, that's great. Uh, Zose is uh, like you so much too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, she was an incredible woman. Uh, am I allowed to talk about her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. So I met her um, about two years ago with her family, and she was one of the, the first Yazidi women that I had met. And the first thing she said to me, she had her fists like this, and she said to me, I'm going to tell my story someday. And so when we were looking for someone to tell the story, I thought, you know, maybe, um, you know, about someone, because we need to have more awareness about what happened to the Yazidi women and the children and so she said she wanted to speak like I uh, and um, she went up there in front of 700 people and told her story and it was very powerful as she said she wanted to do that and she did that and she talked about some some very painful things and she says one day she's going to write a book and I'm sure she will and so one of my friends had um, heard her story um, he had he works with audiovisual and he had some computers and that yeah, I, I, I I see that I watched this one and uh, one computer I give to, give to this family yes yeah. yes and so he, he it was him that he said he wanted to give it to her and to uh, the other Yazidi people so it's it's mm. I'm the one sort of saying let's give it to them but it's really my friend that yeah, wanted yeah, to do it yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and then now uh, the because it's many the I talked with Mr. Neuza too He's my best friend. He's a very, very nice guy. As I talked to him, because he's uh, interpreted uh, with uh, refugee people, and actually is Kurdish Yazidian. He's his wife, Media. Is she's very nice too. Yes, I know them both. Yeah, uh, he's work with uh, refugee yes. Yazidi refugee too. Many refugee women can talk. Still, he's scared. And the other thing I heard about, like one woman have to with London, uh, Ezidi, uh, I don't like give the name, he see the ISIS people is here. And he go to the, ask the government, talk to the government. This guy, I see this guy sell it to me. But the government doesn't do anything. Before six months I make it one uh, one news with my newspaper, I said a uh, thousand ISIS with family come here. And I said, Liberal Party and Justin Trudeau bring me here. You have the Canadian people and Justin Trudeau and government have to be careful about that one. After one month, Toronto Star didn't give uh, my name or didn't give my newspaper name, see newspaper name. And he's making the same uh, news. Mm -hmm. Actually, I worry about this one. Ca Canadian government, this good, bring the many, many people. And I know many ISIS people, 
and uh, change the is if uh, go to another uh, city change the everything his face change the his styles his cut here beer or uh, change the uh, uh, what the <laughs> clothes change the clothes I forget the clothes name. <laughs> Change the clothes and come to the water and Turkey actually is the, the ISIS Turkey government and uh, you know every ISIS uh, and Al Nusra, Al Qaeda and uh, the other different Islamic terrorist group come to Turkey and take it uh, everything with soldier like gun, food money and water back some go to back some go to europe some come canada and like refugees some go to united states maybe different world and different thing yeah. and don't have guarantee tomorrow his or his children his family come here and don't make it terrorist activity you know i i i don't know about the specifics about those circumstances and uh, I uh, you know so I can't say what what is his story or what they were involved with but that this is a problem it's an ongoing problem you have war zones you have two different groups of people at, at war um, you know like for example in Africa and sometimes you have one person and an enemy coming and um, you know it's very hard because in the eyes of the government they're both seen as victims maybe they're not maybe someone's pretending maybe someone's a, a natural uh, someone who's a perpetrator who's actually doing this you know and maybe the government doesn't know or maybe there's a story behind that where they were also victimized I can't tell you I don't know but here once they come here even though we recognize that there's a lot of trauma and conflict before with people we can't have wars here you know we're here to say you know if someone we have to make sure someone's safe um, and if this person is someone who did all these terrible things and then, then it should be pointed out and they should have the the due process with law and be you know and and um, um, and they should investigate but you know, even Iran Iraq war, someone you comes from Iran, someone comes from Iraq, they fight. Like there might be you know, they they may have been enemies yeah. in fighting each other. We what we need to have here is peace. Yeah, this is this uh, I understand. This is a little bit different word. Now is yes. uh, now is uh, before is Kurdish people fighting with uh, now is fighting Turkish government too. And uh, after Turkish government changing and take it some fighting with Kurdish people take it inside or some people run away outside. I don't say that the government take it with word and take it some part. But ISIS is, is little bit different. Yeah, I, no, I agree with you. And if, if yeah. someone was part of ISIS and they did these terrible things to someone, uh, you know, if, first of all, you have to say, you know, is, is that that person? And then, um, you know, I think you need to hold them accountable. You know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a doctor. No. I'm not. Yes, I mean, yes, I'm yes. not a politician. Yeah. But I, you know, it, to me, it's common sense that if someone was really victimizing these other people, then that should have that needs to be taken into consideration. And um, and usually, before someone comes, they they're they're vetted. They're, they they tr investigate who this person is to try to make sure that this person is not a terrorist. Do they always get them? I don't think so. You know, and and so so are there going to be people who have done really terrible things that have come into countries like Canada and the United States and other places? Possibly, right? And so we, you know, we have to do our best to try to, to, to, to, to find that out. And if it is someone who has done these terrible things, they, then there needs to be an investigation. Yes, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> now I, uh, I asked, I come, uh, the back is Canada. As the, now for in the future, what you can say it for for Canadian government for actually is for kids and for women refugee kids and refugee women more uh, more help. Yeah, I mean, I I see these family coming, and 
you know, I don't think there's enough money to support them. A lot of people live in poverty and they can't, you know, have healthy foods and a healthy lifestyle. You know, I'm not talking about anything fancy. I'm just saying basic, basic health. Yeah. And basic, so I think yeah. that uh, more funding for this would be is really important because these are the, the these are the future. The children are the future. You don't want children, you know, not even refugee children, but children, other children in Canada, Indigenous or, or other children. You, you you want to give them the best chance, and they and refugees, they do well in Canada. Um, but I think there needs to be more support. There needs to be more support from through the settlement agencies. When people come, they usually are linked up with a counselor. Um, or someone, a community worker that can help them, you know, find out how do you go get groceries, how do you go to a doctor, how do you, like, just to help them out. And I think that there's really not enough of that. So we need some more support to um, more funding for more settlement workers to help people along their way. I think that's very important. And the, the other thing that uh, in my mind, I, every time I think about kids, now is uh, many I see the many refugee people has come here and uh, very hard to find it right friend yeah and this is uh, uh, mostly is uh, to have economy problem and have uh, language problem that one is mostly make it a bad friend start the word drug like marijuana or start with marijuana after this I like it make it uh, like go some school I see the school the same problem like have it uh, some school have uh, some kids sell a drug or sell a drug medicine something like that how you see with uh, about uh, refugee kids as most important this this part of the hood or whole Canadian for this is this is this problem for whole Canadian uh, kids I, I think that all of Canada is um, adjusting to the new normal of you know legalizing marijuana so or cannabis so that we you know how do you deal with that you know people can people smoke cannabis on the sidewalk can they do this I think with the legalization it it uh, brings a lot of challenges for schools and for parents but on top of that when you are coming from a refugee area from a refugee camp or from area of crisis or your or, or for example ISIS you've got so many more pressures with you and you may be in isolation you may not have friends and so it's easy to um, look for substances in in you know to, to sort of numb some of your feelings so if you've been abused or you've seen someone else abused it's easier to, to turn to drugs um, and so I think that's where we need to try to support you know better support the children and try to find more mental health support. Uh, I don't think there's enough funding for that. Um, but just trying to um, say, you know, yes, you've had a horrible experience um, and you don't wish that experience on anyone, but you just have to have hope and believe in yourself. And we believe in you because, you know, if you look at what happens, all these series of refugees that come, you know, and they're all stressed and they have problems and some of them start some drugs, you know, most of them eventually, they go through that and once they feel secure and they feel supported and that they're valued, that they're valued as a person, they get through that, you know, and that, that so we just have to always have hope for them that things are going to get better. And, um... Gorman, what have to do about that one? about actually about children i know some like uh, some company make it a uh, camping like for refugee people and for every school and uh, but not enough because it's many young people coming yeah yeah and uh, for like i know because if uh, first i come canada as my my kids i can I, I can't take it with camp or go to any location or somewhere and uh, 
some like uh, company take it. Everybody know, but mm. I don't like market advertiser. Uh, take it kit is very nice, very healthy. It's yeah. Kill happy. Yeah. Kit happy. Maybe his government have to be low, more work about the, the situation. Yeah, I I mean. I mean, would the government be responsible for taking children, for example, on canoe trips? Like maybe that's more money than maybe than what they have for this when they're not even giving like money for food. But I think that if we had more opportunities like that, or even if other Canadians make a point of, okay, there's some refugees, new refugee families here, you know, let's include them. Let's take them on camping trips. This is someone new to Canada. Let's embrace them. Let's support them. Let's walk with them to school. If if we, I think, as Canadians, embrace them as someone who have been through, you know, some really difficult times, but the fact that they're here is that they're survivors, right? They they they have whatever it takes to survive, and therefore, what it takes to th to thrive. So we. I think as Canadians can try to include them if we can raise funds for that, if there can be more community activities for refugees, I think there's, if the government can put more support money into um, settlement workers to support the families, like a lot of these women, for example, the cities, their husbands are dead, they're there with like three, four or more children, they can't get out, right? So, exactly. Yeah, so, so if someone can say, hey, I'll babysit your kids. You go for a walk, or you go shopping, or you go sit somewhere, or try to talk to someone, or sit in a park, just have some quiet time, or go upstairs and read, or or whatever makes you feel more calm. You know that's something that we can do. That is that that people can do. Actually, I can I like to maybe you can uh, tell the people too. I like my tell them my people, Kurdish people, and Turkish or any people. If can take it like one day take it any refugee family take it with restaurant, you you can make it one day is uh, kids with mom or with uh, every family take it with movie, like you can take it one day one family one if little bit economy is as better, can take it with a zoo or CN Tower or Negara Fas, this one I ask. Of course, everything government can do it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the government can can do it. Go to one one person, one people, one people take it uh, with somewhere. But it's people can do it. Yes, and if you have, for example, the Kurdish community, if you have a list of families that would really like to participate in that, would like to go to these places, and you know people who. Are you know maybe Kurdish or not, uh, but you know the language is uh, there has to be some communication. But you have a list of people, and then people can say, yeah, I want to be one of the volunteers, and I want to take you know one family it could be the community one family once a month, once a year, you know to to as you said, CN Tower the zoo to give them the opportunity of being like other kids and having those opportunities. I think it would be very valuable, very. Very yeah, this, very this important. Is, this is this is very important because yes. as, as because kid is, ha, I said kid, what you want? He said I don't want friend. Yeah. That's like the didn't say toys, didn't say money, this didn't say chocolate. He just I need a new friend. Yeah. yeah. This is I just I, my question is for everybody. Every people first coming is a refugee. This is Canada and multicultural place. That's why every first, every refugee after every Canadian people. If you can take it once a year, once a month, one family, take it somewhere, you make it very, very good. Very, very good uh, program for him. Maybe for him, because f for himself too. I know is many people twenty four hour work, just twelve hours, sixteen hour. I understand everything. Don't have time. You have children, but once a month, once a time, or three months, once a time, don't take it too much. That's just one time. Yeah. 
time. Thank you so much for sure. coming. Uh, actually, I come in the house. <laughs> yes, okay. But thank you so much for interview. My pleasure. You are uh, best mom and best doctor. Too kind. Thank you so much. <laughs> and last word, what you say with people and with Canadian government, just tell and after done. That the refugees are, it's such an opportunity to have refugees here. And if we can nurture and support and love them and, and just give them just a little bit of additional support, they will thrive. It is, they are the backbone of, of Canadian society. So um, I'm privileged um, to be working with this community. I'm privileged that I've, I've met refugees such as your friends. Um, you know, through my work at Costi, uh, and I, and every day I, I, I see these people that are brave, um, and I know, even though they can't see that they will amount to great things, I see it. I see that one day that you know people like Zosia, Zosia will will write their book, and uh, you know, build their restaurants, have their communities. I, I have a lot of hope. Uh, and that's why I do the work that I do, because I think it's just a great uh, group of people to work with. Thank you so much again. Y you're welcome. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for watching Mitani TV. Make sure to follow Go Live TV and all of our multicultural shows. Download the app in your phone and subscribe to our social media, and we'll see you next time.